Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I hope you everyone had a nice coffee and tea. Um, it's so sad we are all uh, end of this conference, but this is not the end, but this is still the beginning. We had a wonderful two days of uh, connecting each other, talking about open street map, mapping, open data efforts, and so much to do uh, in the future. So I hope you'll all be connected like you have started your connections here. Um, so our closing, notes uh, closing keynote speaker, Siddharth, is here. Um, so we'll be cl closing this amazing conference with a beautiful uh, talk by Siddharth. Um, Siddharth is a long-time OpenStreetMap contributor and a community builder. Uh, he'll share his experience working with communities, mapping core and informal structure, and his leadership at Kabadiwala Connect. Welcome, Siddharth. Hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I hope I do justice. Uh, this is, it's been a while since I've uh, spoken for 30 minutes, so I'm going to try to uh, present a lot of the experiences I've had with mapping, um, and speak about how I came uh, to be uh, the founder and CEO of a company called Kabadiwala Connect, which is what I work on full time now. So we are a, a waste management company that provides smart waste collection and processing solutions that's powered by the informal sector. Um, <coughs> my background is uh, pro uh, I'm a spatial data analyst by training. I uh, used to do a lot of GIS remote sensing stuff for uh, in, the, in the urban development space. Um, specifically running uh, projects on community mapping um, and visualization, uh, always with some kind of, uh, like some intent, uh, not just collecting data. Uh, and I, maybe I, I'd like to share a little bit about that first. So uh, I just pulled out an old presentation of mine, actually. Uh, this is from 2012, I think. I'm gonna c I called it SIDS mapping stuff. Um, for me, there's a very, and, and again, I don't, I don't like preaching to the choir over here, I don't need to say this, but I just very quickly, just want to quickly highlight something very important that we all know, I'm sure. There is a distinction, I think, that when we, when we speak about mapping and making maps. Uh, mapping, and it's, it's, a, it's a very sensitive uh, uh, subject, and uh, especially when you regard who's using that data, for what purpose. So for example, if you take a, uh, take a map of uh, India, uh, something that we all drew in when we were in school, um, and we ask, we ask normally when we ask people, "Hey, what is what is a map?" Uh, one of the the biggest uh, definitions of map is it's a representation of the Earth's surface. Um, this is a, a wordle of uh, that brings 321 definitions of a map uh, and visualizes the frequency of words. So you can see, you know, a map is a representation of a part of Earth's surface. That, that really is the defining picture. But honestly, it's uh, not really. It's, it's actually an expression of power, especially depending on who the mapper is. Uh, so for example, if you take the India map, and uh, this is the map that they use to organize the census, and you look at this up there, where there's a huge uh, unadministered territory. And if I went to the same school, and uh, instead of giving this map to color, and if I gave them this map, it becomes suddenly a very political conversation. Uh, similar, in, in, and this happens constantly uh, as mappers, of course, you may know this. Uh, this is a ward map of uh, a place in, 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 uh, in Chennai. Uh, Urur Kupam, actually, over there, I don't know if you can see it, right, right there is, uh, is actually a fishing village that preceded the urban development in that area in South Chennai. And they're represented by three, three streets over there. So when you kind of look at it, this is how the, the map looks. But actually, there are a ton of roads uh, that walk that go through it. It's just not represented. Um, and there is a, there are a lot of political reasons for this. So I think that for us, we should always understand that you, you really can't take your subjective. You're always bringing subjectivity into, into data representation. And that's, that's, that's something that's uh, innate. And we have to be very aware of that. Um, I like to actually read maps as text, as you would read a book. So you always question the author, you question the narrative. Um, I also like thinking of maps as a series of propositions. Um, you know, if you look at the history, I'm sure somebody covered this is, uh, you know, in born in military applications and things like that. Um, simple illustration, this is how we learned what Australia is, but Australia could also be represented like this in the way indigenous tribes view their territory. Uh, just something to keep in mind, this was very powerful for me whenever, when I started working, I really liked this concept. Uh, because what now, especially that's you know, it's you know, it's, it's, it's never been easier to map stuff. Uh, there's so many tools and technologies that are out there. It's a very very powerful tool. 
Um, and people are redeploying the power of maps in very, very interesting ways. And there's a whole subject of counter mapping and neo geography. If you want to get academic about it, there's there's a there's this whole conversation. Um, <coughs> so for me, when I think about maps and mapping, I like to think about mapping as something that's a continuous process uh, embedded in a particular context and leveraged strategically. Um, it's, it's a very political partic It could be very participatory and reflexive if we allow it. Um, the other way I also like to think of it, this is the old mapper, this kind of white guy who's coming in, serving the territory, and this is mine kind of stuff, uh, to this. Kids going out and mapping different things and, and putting and, and locating things and talking about how things are on the ground and using that data to tell a story. Um, so let me, uh, in this presentation, I kind of want to kind of lead up to how, uh, so right now, again, I don't do any kind of mapping work. Well, I do, but it's very specific to my company. We're a for-profit social enterprise. But I, I wanted to run through some old projects that I'm very, very, uh, I, I'm very happy about. Um, so the first one is this community mapping at Urur on Alcott Kupim. So one of the projects in Chennai a few years ago, they wanted to build an elevated expressway. Uh, and uh, they had this idea where from, from one point in the middle of the city on the coast, it was gonna, they were going to build an expressway going out to the sea, kind of cutting in for about 20 kilometers and connecting into the, uh, into the IT industrial area down south. Um, and during this process, they were going to kind of like, uh, they were going to move or relocate 13 fishing villages. And the reasoning was, they said, look, this fishing village, they're more like a slum. They don't really do any activity of fishing anymore. Uh, we can relocate them in the hinterland where we have a couple of resettlement colonies. So one thing that was interesting in that aspect was there, there's the CRZ law, uh, the coastal cover regulatory zone uh, um, law, and in that there was this very interesting term saying that traditional fishing uh, fish uh, fishermen should could be left alone. So how do you define traditional, right? Uh, so what we did is we went to the community, we, we, you know, we uh, printed out some satellite images, and we started getting different folks to start telling us um, what, how they used the coastline. What were the different traditional uses that they had for the coastline? They created their own key. They started mapping it, you know, just drawing it around. Uh, very interesting when, you know, we were like, we had to push them, say, hey, you know, you have to define some spaces. It became very tough, this whole idea of like fuzziness in the boundary. But we were using, we were trying to get this data to actually use it in a very specific context, to create some maps that, that, they c that the fishing community, the panchayat could take and use to claim traditional use on that, on that, on that area. Um, and that was just a fascinating experience because it was, it was quite, it was quite uh, successful. And most recently, uh, there was an article in BBC now for three, four years down the line. So very simple tools. And we trained a few uh, fi uh, folks from the fishing community. And then they just started taking this and, and mapping everywhere. So Saruna, who's a good friend, now leads this kind of mapping. His, his goal is to map, I think, every fishing village in Tamil Nadu and taking that data to really, really like challenge the government a lot whenever they have different projects that they want to kind of uh, take in. So this data actually, Sa Saruna is sitting on this incredible data set. Um, and ha could, we, could we open this out on OSM? I don't know. Uh, but it's just a fantastic resource that uh, the fishing community now in, in Tamil Nadu at least is using to kind of lay claim to their to the to the domain. Um, it's one example. Okay, the other example that I it was was very interesting for me, and this unfortunately, unlike the fishing community uh, work, was not didn't really go anywhere. But I really I I think that there's there's a lot of power in this. Uh, is the uh, and when I w I worked in a Hyderabad Urban Lab uh, for a year. And when I was there, I, I was working very closely with a bunch of groups who were very interested in water bodies and water quality in Hyderabad. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that the strategies that they had uh, at the time was to go to, a to go to a water body and actually just make a fence around it and say, okay, you know, we've saved this water body, remove encroachments and things like that. But the problem is you have to think about the lake in its catchment, right? 
and you'd have a lot of times when people kind of like putting putting fences around these lakes but uh at still the water was depleting there was there was really how do you think about the lake as a series of interconnected uh, uh, um, kind of uh, bodies and how do we work with this idea of a ridge mentality of the catchment area and things like that so we took some dem data uh, uh, and and we uh, and so this is the digital elevation data of hyderabad that's the ghmc boundaries i think hmda boundaries uh, and we generated catchment areas uh, so I'm sure everybody knows the catchment area basically is how what it defines how water travels within that catchment. Uh, with the DEM data, you can also generate stream networks, so you can really understand how how water flows within that catchment based on the elevation model. Um, and I took another data set. We took some Landsat imagery and very quick and dirty with because of the spectral response of water is so is so specific. We just pulled out a lot of the water bodies um, uh, and. I kind of put a centroid on the in the center of that body, so two disconnected. So and then this is we generated the what we think was water bodies in Hyderabad. So if you kind of look at it, it's it's tough to make out a pattern, but when we actually took this data and like mapped it on the stream networks, it it mapped so beautifully, and suddenly for the first time we could we could speak to local communities who are interested in water quality and water mapping to think about to think about how each water body worked. So for example, when you take the stream catchment, the quality of the water body downstream really matters uh, uh, from what happens upstream, right? So we started thinking about interconnected water bodies in this way, and, and then again, it becomes quite complicated because the water bodies are in different administrative boundaries, et cetera, et cetera. So it became a quite an interesting challenge. But the idea of how do we understand water bodies in relation to each other this was something that when we showed to a lot of different communities, they got very excited by because suddenly you can say, oh, you know, I don't know why this 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 quality is going down. Maybe it's something to do upstream. Let me go see that. L let me so let me go see what's happening there, et cetera, et cetera. And that was uh, a lot of it was it was a very interesting uh, idea that you could kind of take anywhere. Um, unfortunately, we didn't we didn't get too far with it. Um, we did something recently in Chennai as well, uh, where uh, you know in 2015 we had this very bad flood, right? And one thing that we realized in 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 Tamil Nadu actually is you have these water tanks, these traditional water tanks um, that was used to kind of move water in a flat area. So it was it's really beautiful kind of human engineered way of getting water to move from one area to another in a primarily flat area, and unfortunately. These these uh, uh, water tanks or Aries, uh, they they during British time they were not they were not codified as water bodies, but they were codified as Porumbok land, uh, and Porumbok is uh, is this kind of it means kind of wasteland, and uh, the government actually has been using that little bit of a glitch in the classification of Porumbok to really do all sorts of strange things. Um, the so for example in Chennai. All the IT, the you know, we had this huge IT boom where a lot of like land was given. We we're building these IT corridors and things like that. A lot of Porumbok land was actually given by the 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 the, the public. Uh, what is it? TN, whatever, whatever the the age, the the public works department, uh, hundred year leases I think to uh, to build on these areas. And when you actually when the flood happened, a lot of the software guys got uh, flooded. Uh, so for example, you can see Vela Cherry. Uh, Airy uh, and how oops, and how much of it has been and how much of it has been uh, kind of like encroached on systematic quite systematically so something that I got excited about was uh, okay if we take all these revenue the old revenue maps um, so this is a little bit further south this is in Palikarnai if you take these revenue maps and you kind of look at it, there are certain areas that have been encroached. So again, you have two areas up there. S there are certain areas that have been encroached and certain areas that are not. So could we think about a project where we digitize every revenue map, uh, collaborate on digitizing these area boundaries, and start thinking about protection from the peri-urban area in? So places that are not encroaching are not encroached but could be encroached. Then could we take map a lot of the land documents, 
uh, that the ADs have and provide that to journalists and say, okay, look, uh, this has already been encroached, but what, what happened? What really happened? Can we build some momentum around thinking about this? Given the context of the flood is so, is so like, uh, is so like alive in everybody's mind. Maybe we can build some traction in community to think about 80s and something. Uh, didn't go anywhere. Uh, <laughs> I wish it had, but it was, uh, it, was very, it was very exciting to think about it this way. Um, the next thing we did, uh, something that I, I, I got interested in was education. Uh, so we, we, we took a lot of the data of the, the universities and we again, we collected a lot of data, but we wanted to show, we wanted to show like the, g the spatial d growth of universities um, from when we started, 1857. And we kind of wanted to see what was going on. Like what, what is, how do we think about uh, our education and what's going on in the country given, uh, given the way, you know, uh, universities and colleges are kind of popping up everywhere. So we started, we looked at the main universities, right? Central, state, private, deemed universities and ins institutes of national importance. And we just plotted it uh, when they, when they kind of, when they kind of started developing. Um, this, this actual, uh, this data, we actually worked with a wire on a seven piece, uh, seven piece kind of like discussion about, about education. Uh, honestly, when I, when I first start, took this data, I was like, oh man, you know, the, the idea that I wanted to have with this was take this data to build some kind of like new, new narrative on India's, India's education. Can we think about why, where we are right now, what's going on, and from there, can we craft this new narrative? Didn't, it didn't really go anywhere, but I'm, I think this data was really, really exciting. Um, something that was fascinating for me was the years 2000 and 2008 and 2009 were really, really something, there was a departure in something like normal. Before, when you see in kind of the 80s, you see this kind of standard growth of state universities and, and central universities. 91, when kind of India l uh, opened up, you see suddenly a lot of like deemed universities. Actually, the first private, un there are two universities that came up, priv uh, the private colleges. But since 2008, there was this burst, like burst of like private and deemed, uh, deemed universities. Actually, deemed universities is very interesting. There was this big burst of deemed universities till about 2011, I think, when there was this, this expose on deemed universities, and after that, zero. Uh, but private universities have been really, really growing. And when you think about the spatial distribution of, of these universities, you actually see these kind of big educational clusters coming up. And I think that it's just a fascinating space that I wish I could explore in more detail. <laughs> um, but if, if there's anybody interested in this, please, please have a look at the seven part series. Uh, I worked with uh, a guy called Thomas Manuel, who really, uh, he's a freelance journalist and he really, he really analyzed, <laughs> he really, really analyzed this data, which is really, really good. And he's, he's also a really good writer. So uh, take a look at the seven part series. It's quite, it was quite interesting. Okay, um, so let me get back to uh, waste management and, and what I do. Uh, so again, so those data experiments for me personally, I really, really enjoyed it, but uh, I always really struggle on the long term, like the long term sustainability of working with data. For me, pers you know, there, there were two, three avenues. Uh, there was the, uh, the research avenue where you work with a research university and things like that. You work towards your PhD. Um, and, and, and for me, I really struggled to find the right fit for me. Um, I, uh, I had already, I had always kind of been interested in waste management. So when I was in, when I was in college, me and a few friends, we started organizing beach cleanups. Um, and we, we did really well, but very quickly we realized that beach cleanups was not really a kind of like a scalable solution, uh, doing anything. We're just moving waste from one place to another. So we started thinking about waste as, uh, a more complicated matter. And one of the, f the things that I, I'm very, very proud that we did with that youth group. So this is when we were like maybe 20, 21. Uh, we, we, put, we did a first like audit of uh, an the RDR estuary in Chennai. So let me just quickly show you that video. Yeah, so, so we, did, we did a very, like we, we went to the, uh, the estuary 
where a lot of plastic was being dumped on the rivers and all, all of those rivers kind of converged in this estuary or at least a couple of really important streams converged in this estuary. And what we were trying to do was see what waste wound up there and try to understand who was, who was actually responsible for creating this waste. So this was a few years ago and what, uh, where when the idea of extended producer responsibility wasn't very, very strong in, in, uh, in India. Um, the idea of extended producer responsibility really is the brand puts out material, they should be responsible for making sure that that material, like something happens after somebody consumes it. Um, and, one the and, and this report that we put out really kind of like went into detail on the data that we collected. Um, so we, we, looked, we looked at, you know, what kind of company, what kind of sector, what kind of material it was, you know, which companies were responsible. So HUL, for example, uh, had 29 unique products that we found in the estuary. Um, you know, what type of, like, what sector was it? Like, you know, was it in, like, was it food or was it household and things like that? And this really got me thinking about waste management in a, in a very uh, more structured way, I would say. So, uh, so I became very interested because at the time when we were doing cleanups, we, we had a lot of waste pickers coming in and picking up certain kinds of material. I became very interested in thinking and understanding the informal supply chain. So as you know, and this is true in Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, the informal sector really dominates the recovery and processing of post-consumer waste. Um, however, it's, it's kind of a black hole. Nobody really knows like what's going on in the sector. So. Uh, I was uh, I, I, I was lucky enough actually to win a grant from the World Economic Forum, where we started mapping kabadiwalas in Chennai. Uh, this this so each of this these data points is actually a small shop. Uh, they they on on average ca these kabadiwala shops recover about 50 to 300 kgs of of plastic actually of uh, uh, every week, um, and they do paper, plastic, glass, and metal. Um, and we, we did this really, really detailed study into the informal sector. So we asked about 140 different questions on the demographics, the networks, the, the types of materials, the price points, the storage practices, and things like that. And honestly, at the time when we were, when we were doing this research, I actually was collecting this data to, to do a PhD. I was like, okay, you know, I, I looked at the academic literature, and I said, okay, there's, there is some conversation about informality, but mainly the discussion is around waste pickers the most marginalized stakeholder in this supply chain. But actually, there are waste pickers, there are what we call now level one aggregators, or kabadiwalas, or lapaks in Indonesia, um, and, and level two aggregators, or larger middlemen, traders, and processors, and things like that. Um, and what was their contribution, and how do we work with this supply chain became, became a very interesting kind of perspective for me. I felt that there was a very interesting business opportunity in in working with this ecosystem. So Kabadiwala Connect uh, right now, um, actually maybe if I can, let me see if I can give you a little bit more context. Um, where did it? So let me, let, me, let me give you a little bit context. So, so urban India, currently we generate close to 70 million tons of waste every year. Now, what the formal system, whatever the municipality collects, over 90% is actually sent to a landfill. You can't even call these places landfills. Honestly, they're open dump sites. Um, it's a huge problem. By 2041, they estimate about 160 million tons being generated by urban India. Now, if you look at one of the reasons why waste is like such a problem, it's because we haven't figured out how to procure material from small and medium waste generators, so your apartments, households, and all of these kinds of places. It's a, it's a very, very, very expensive process to collect such you know, volumes, disaggregated volumes. You know, when a household is giving you 300 grams of material every, every, uh, every week sometimes. So when you actually consider recycling, uh, it's, it's really, really hard to do at scale. Now, in the West, what they have done is you know, they focus on legislation and, 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 and incentives for your small and medium waste generators. So on Wednesday, do this, or you'll be fine, and things like that. They take that material and they put it on a segregated curbside collection, so your paper, plastic, glass, metal. The idea there is really to create a purer waste stream. That material then goes to a transfer station where you have a purer waste stream, 
and you do some basic processing. Let's say you bale the material or you shred something and things like that. Then finally, the material that you can't do anything with, it goes to the landfill. Now in India, that system is completely broken. Uh, there has been so much push by, by the government to try to organize segregation. It's just a very, very expensive, complicated problem. But, and, but in that gap, because there's so much value in certain types of material, there is this very, very interesting informal sector, starts with waste pickers, uh, who actually pick up material, they don't have an input cost, they collect material, they sell it to a kabadiwala, that guy aggregates higher volumes, does some basic processing in some cases, uh, then they sell it to a level two aggregator who does some heavier processing, aggregates higher volumes, and then sells that to a processor. So we became very interested, I became very interested in how do you leverage this, and, and given a lot of my failure in taking something that I was very passionate about, like my wa the water stuff that I had done and all of that, I was like, okay, what is the mechanism through which we can start, I can work on this in a potentially sustainable way. So I, I got very interested in the idea of social entrepreneurship, for-profit social entrepreneurship, so profit with purpose. Uh, and what we did uh, after we mapped this, this supply chain was we set up a small plastic recovery facility uh, that buys material from the informal sector. So at, at, at this point, when we set up this facility, the common understanding or the common kind of like narrative in the developing world was there is zero waste infrastructure, there is this informal sector, but they're all mafia guys, you know, nobody's gonna work with them, and they're gonna come, if you try to set up anything, they're gonna come and try to kill you, and all of those, that kind of stuff. Not true. They're entrepreneurial guys, they, if you work with the market, if you work with them in mind, and you work, and, and they trust you, you can build great relationships. They're actually, it's a very, very interesting supply chain. There's a lot wrong with it, uh, but these are, these are, this supply chain exists and it's very robust. So our data, for example, this initial segue we had to try to understand the informal sector in Chennai, our data suggested that about 180,000 tons of material were already recovered by the informal sector every year. That's about 33% of, of the post-consumer recyclable waste that Chennai already puts out. It's, uh, I think, $200,000 of revenue every day or something like this, I forget the exact number, but it's very, very robust. Um, having said that, there were a bunch of operational challenges. Uh, there, was, there were issues on information asymmetry, there were issues on proper processing, there were, there were issues on health and safety. So what we felt was if we set up a small plastic recovery facility and we worked with them and we bought material from Kabadiwala shops, L1 aggregators, and we used tech, very simple tech, to actually allow us to work with the smallest of aggregators, there was something that we could do through the market to improve compliance and improve behavior while also talking about solving the waste management crisis in, 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 in Chennai. That fared really well. We were very lucky. Uh, we've recovered about 400 tons of PET so far. Um, uh, we, have, we have recovered about 400 tons of PET so far. Uh, uh, this year, we did about $180,000 uh, $180, worth of revenue just on PET recycling alone. Um, we've connected about 15,000 households in Chennai to their local Kabadiwala shop. Uh, we, we have this, uh, because, uh, we, so we make sure that all the vendors we work with actually uh, use our app to kind of report when they have material, which is very, very key if you want to work with a brand who requires uh, upstream traceability uh, in the material. I don't want to get too technical, but essentially this informal sector represents a, a decentralized waste management pathway for uh, cities in India and and also cities in the developing world. So we work now in five cities. We work in uh, two cities in, 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 in India, Chennai and Bombay, uh, two cities in Indonesia, Samarang and Surabaya, and one city in uh, Africa in the Ivory Coast in Abidjan. Um, and we see the same kind of informal ecosystem. Uh, so for example, this is a map of the Kabadiwalas in Chennai. Um, and we have just started mapping the Kabadiwala shops or the Lapak shops, the pr small primary aggregators in Semarang. And the idea really is because these guys already exist in this local area, they can actually serve a lot of the needs of the community for waste management. So you connect more households to these guys. Uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can get more of these aggregators to report together to solve the, the, the logistics issue of waste management. And, in, and, 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 and this is critical, our approach really is 
we believe that the informal sector so these kabadi wala shops if we incentivize them properly they will take care of the waste pickers under them so the idea also is this kind of distributed model of working with the most marginalized stakeholders um and we try to really be ecosystem enablers in this um currently we work with a french company called violia a very large waste management company looking to kind of get into the developing world and we have projects running with unilever and denon so denon is our partner in indonesia uh, aqua denon aqua uh, if there been in anyone knows that and unilever is a hindustan unilever where they've actually put out the first uh the first contract for multi layer packaging so so again one of uh, let le so i i i post i post this thing in a german conference actually where you had a lot of like german engineers and i said look if we were to think about how much it would cost to recover a new material in uh, a developed world city and a developing world city with the informal infrastructure which would be cheaper so for example uh, right now you know people recycle paper plastic glass and metal uh take tetra pack which technically you can do some upcycling you know you can do something if we would to go to every kabadi wala and say look here's the price for tetra pack work with your waste pickers we'll connect you to households start collecting tetra pack actually the signal that you get is a much quicker kind of signal to start collecting material and we did this actually we proved this with with uh, unilever with multi layer packaging so for example all you have a lot of these chips packets and like and 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 biscuit packets and things that people really can't they don't know what to do with now technically if you have enough volume of this mlp you can or multi layer packaging you can take that material and send it to a cement kiln and the cement kiln will burn it to make cement reducing their requirement of a virgin material to make cement now the problem is there is no infrastructure to collect mlp or so they say uh so what we did was we worked with about 34 stakeholders in chennai to start collecting mlp and we tested it okay what do you need what is the price that works for you what is the price that you need to work with your waste picker and we found that right that right configuration and one kabadi wala shop from doing zero in week 1 started doing 30 40 kgs in week 2 and now is doing about 160 kgs so that's really interesting because when you think of this kind of de decentralized always will win it's the cheaper more efficient solution um so this is really something that we're propagating the other thing of course again you know when when we consider when we consider the idea of the informal sector it becomes very easy to build build certain kinds of different solutions so for example what one of the pain points that we realized even for kabadi walas was to a household or to an apartment there was not enough volume for them to even go there and pick it up so we developed this kind of simple like a uh, uh, fill sensor kind of a thing where when there was enough material it would kind of like it would it would report now we didn't do this in the context of us trying to pick it up but rather what we wanted to do was create uh, a network of iot enabled bins for a kabadi wala serving a particular administrative area um and and that that is very interesting because it kind of solves two pain points one is when you want to build a loyalty with with your kabadi wala and say look man you're doing 300 kgs i can help you get 300 kgs more uh these are all the bins that you have access to but you have to do kyc you have to digitize you know you have to digitize some of your processes i need to know which waste because you're working with i need to know what money you're paying them you know you have to do all these compliance metrics that are important to me if you want access to this material and if you want access to a premium price so market based incentives we're seeing some traction on actually improving or of that guy wanting to do more compliance on the other side with residents suddenly you can tell them look you put your material in this bin within 4 hours somebody will come and pick it up so suddenly you have this kind of on demand waste collection service something that the municipality cannot do can you imagine the municipal make the municipality making a commitment to pick it up within 6 hours that's just not possible because of the nature of the supply chain so these solutions become very very interesting very simple so another another simple example is uh, with a kabadi wala shop when a waste picker comes and drops off material they have to pay them immediately right but when they take that material and sell to a larger guy sometimes that guy pays him only in 3 days so he has a working capital crunch so technically the guy might have space to actually procure more material but he doesn't have a working capital facility now he's not going to get a working capital facility from a bank is he but maybe we can create a credit worthiness for him and actually and actually explore microfinance for the working capital So that's something that we're trying in Indonesia. So all of these solutions actually really come from this data exploration that we've done. And our our real our real belief is that 
this supply chain represents just a completely way of, new way of doing waste management. And from my perspective of how do you leverage data to do something good, how do you leverage data to kind of make a difference or do something that you're passionate about, we've had a lot of traction with this kind of for-profit model. Um, there are a lot of challenges with it, uh, you know, it is of course a lot of challenges. So, so one of the things that I'm very excited to do is how do we open this data out? Um, so one good thing that we're working with these folks with Veolia and with, with uh, Denone and, and Unilever and all of that, they're very big guys. For them, the data is not so much important but the volume coming in. And I think now is something that we are, is a time where we are very interested in to kind of tell this story. So something that I see with OSM, and this is kind of maybe the final point that I'd like to make, is OSM, one of the, one of the places where it gets a lot of traction when there's a lot of movement is disaster relief, right? Uh, where there's just a nice confluence of different people coming together to say, okay, we need this, this core data is so important. And we're coming to a point now with waste management where brands really, are going to put in a lot of money to recycle. So last week, uh, two weeks ago, I was in Bali where brands made about $1.8 billion commitment for recycling. The mechanism through which is brands have, uh, they're saying, look, look, it's going to be a cost from doing business. It's not going to be CSR anymore. It's actually going to be as a cost of doing business. And they're looking for solutions. So suddenly, there's a lot of kind of push to say, hey, we can do this and we can do that. And one of the, the biggest issues that we have is just this lack of data on the informal sector. Um, and because of that, there are a lot of solutions that in a lot of cases hurt the informal sector or don't work with the, the latent strengths of this, of, this, of, this, of this supply chain. So one push that I would really like to say to the OSM community is, can we get together to map every supplier, uh, informal vendor, informal waste vendor out there. It's a really, really important time to kind of tell this story in different cities. Hey, there are in Chennai, we found 2,000 guys, 180,000 tons. What's the scene in Surabaya and Samarong? We'll know soon. But what about Jakarta? What about, you know, in the Philippines? There is this amazing opportunity right now to build da a data set on a completely decentralized informal waste supply chain that will really educate people now with the money on what is the best way to approach to make sure that it is built in an inclusive way. And I'd love to chat about how that's possible. Um, we are very interested in working with the OSM community in Indonesia, uh, in India, in the Philippines to start, to start thinking about some of this stuff. Maybe uh, we can help organize mapping parties or something like this. Um, yeah, that's, that's, I guess that's, all I wanted to say, uh, if I can sum up for me personally, uh, I've always been really, really excited about data and the power of data uh, to do something to tell a story, uh, to do something to tell a story. Um, uh, but one of the things that I've always struggled with is what's the long-term sustainability? Um, when you work, I've worked on collecting data in two, three different perspectives. Uh, one is an activist, uh, which is easy to do when you're in college, honestly. Um, the second, in kind of a think tank, you know, urban development, uh, public uh, or private institution. The frustration for me there was these grant cycles um, and who really dictates, you know, uh, the, the grant. Like, I find it so hilarious that I'm the w I was the one with like 50,000 Swiss francs to go and map or do the first census of Kabadiwalas. The oldest Kabadiwala we found operating in Chennai has operated for, I think, uh, 48 years or something like that. You know, it's it's really this this I feel like there is this there is this gap in 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 south uh, I, or uh, you know south to south learning or south learning in general. We have this kind of like top down mentality of how money comes into institutions that really bothered me. Um, social enterprise, I found I found some 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 traction there just because we built a business model, but you know you can't really build a business model around everything. Uh, we were lucky in this case that there was this confluence of people caring about plastic and brands wanting to put in some serious money and we had done a lot of this data and analysis and you know recycling work in in this sector to kind of work together um, but for me I think if there's anybody out there who's working on an interesting data set who's like okay how do we how do we leverage this what do we do I think this idea of social entrepreneurship is pretty interesting and I'd, I'd love to speak about that in, you know on your perspectives on that as well um, so I think we have a few more minutes, five, four minutes or something like this.
just a few questions or 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 you can connect with me later also whatever whatever you want to do Hi, uh, thank you for this amazing, uh, amazing uh, speech. And it was lovely to see everything that you were doing. Mm -hmm. And besides, of course, the details of the stuff that you went to, I was quite curious about the platforms that you were using right now yeah. to tell the stories of these maps itself. I mean, I was fascinated by the transparency that you used and, and some of the other stuff. I mean, that, that, that le without those tools, the storytelling would not have been so powerful. And I was just curious about uh, the, the So I, I have, so I've, I've been working, so again, um, I'm, I'm more of the ideas guy with some technical, with some basic technical competency. Um, most of my 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 skill set really is in grass and 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 uh, and uh, and uh, you know Arc and all of that you know like QGIS and stuff like that. A lot of the web stuff I work very closely with my partner, who's actually now the COO of my company of Kabadi Wala Connect. So we we did a lot of this work together. Um, so we'd get yeah we'd get excited about some data and then work on it and, and we we think honestly when we take the day we're going to change the world so we spend a lot of time with the storytelling component but you know <laughs> a lot of the times it doesn't go anywhere uh but yeah that's that's the context i i don't do any of this web mapping stuff i i work with in fact we have one of uh, yeah anand also over there has done a lot of this work i think you you're the one who worked on this map right yeah, so anyways you should talk to anand <laughs> a next question <coughs> Hands uh, up, please, I cannot see. Oh. <coughs> uh, could you please elaborate on the incentives that are provided to L1 aggregators in order to ensure that the models benefit reach the ground level sanitation workers? Yeah. And how far do you think have these incentives really worked for sanitation workers? My second question is, we know of sanitation work to be very heavily regulated by caste. So when you entered this sector, yep. could you share a little bit about your experiences only with respect to caste-based yeah, differentiation? Yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, so the first question about incentives. Uh, so our approach is traceability is the first step. Uh, and we're very early days in this. So for example, in Chennai, we worked with one Kabadiwala shop. And that Kabadiwala has been incentivized through just by getting one rupee extra for every kg that he sells to us to report on his tier two traceability. So who comes and drops off material to him? So if there are waste pickers who don't have an Aadhaar card, for example, or any government ID, we, we start looking at that and we start, we, we work with some NGO partners to say, okay, how do we, how do we work with them? So in Indonesia, for example, we work with Dompet Duafa. Uh, who's done a lot of work on like getting you know government uh, government identification and things like that? It's very early days, so we we really need the data to tell us from a user perspective how we are going to support the 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 L zero or L the L zero level, which are the waste pickers and itinerant and buyers who are really the most marginalized. But our theory of change is rather than say, look, we are the guys who are going to organize all the waste pickers. We're going to say we're going to work with the Kabadiwala and incentivize this guy properly to get his waste pickers and itinerant and buyers to to kind of to a different level. Now, when we looked at the data with waste pickers, there are really two kinds of waste pickers. There are waste pickers who really consider themselves as um, as staff to the Kabadiwala, so they will go out collect 20 kgs every day, and they do that because they see some kind of long-term thing. So maybe 10 years, I'm going to have a small shop, or I'm going to get more work, or or you know, or, or or but in some cases also something bad. Like they'll give them a small loan, ten thousand rupees, and they lock them in forever. You know what I mean? So some bad behavior. And then you have actually the really most marginalized waste pickers who kind of find themselves somewhere, pick up some material, and find a local kabadiwala shop and 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 sell it to them. So they are the ones who get the worst price. So for us, very early days, but we're taking this traceability idea as really really critical to build an ecosystem of how do we support the waste picker. Like, just some statistics, I think the World Bank has said there's one to two percent of the global population actually gets their primary resource from scavenging. Uh, in India, that means it's 15 million people. So it's a, it's a huge, huge challenge. But we believe that this approach of this decentralized working with the micro-entrepreneur and, and way up is a, is a more scalable kind of route. 
So that's question number one. Question number two was uh, experience on, oh, the caste element, yeah. So in, in, uh, in Chennai, 95% of shop owners were male uh, and most of the women were the ones working as labor. So they're the ones who are directly related to, to the health and safety hazards that they have with segregating dirty material and plastic and things like this. Um, we didn't collect caste information. Uh, we made a decision not to. We tried a small sample of like trying to collect like, you know, caste became just too complicated. It gave a lot of pushback, so we didn't collect that. But we collected a lot of interesting other kinds of data. So when we looked at, uh, we asked a lot of people where, where their hometown was. And in Chennai, about 70% actually, their hometown is in Trichy. So it seems like 30 years ago, somebody came here and has created a pipeline of labor from, from Trichy to come into Chennai. Um, yeah, just a lot of, lot of fascinating things. But unfortunately, we didn't really collect the caste. But when you look at just simple male, female kind of thing, you see a lot more f women uh, injecting or ingesting more of the risk and more of the hazard. Okay, uh, my question is, the first question is, was there any specific reason you choose Sumarang and Surabaya instead of other city in Indonesia? And the second reason, maybe you have explained, is there any local partner that helped uh, you guys to collect the, all the lapak uh, the in Sumarang and Surabaya? Yeah. And the last question, how long this project has been running? Yeah. And what's your challenges in specifically, specifically in Indonesia? Uh, so far, the it's not been so challenging, to be honest. It's been very exciting just because the supply chain in India and, and, and in Indonesia are very similar. The only difference, the major difference is in, in India, in the Indian cities, you have much smaller kabadiwala shops um, and you have waste pickers serving these kabadiwala shops. In Indonesia, or it seems in the cities when we, that we've looked in, the L1 aggregators are much larger op and they are, they are fed by a much more motorized ecosystem. So a lot more itinerant buyers with motorbikes going out and collecting material, right? So it's kind of interesting. So for us, the logistics challenge wasn't really key here because there's so many shops everywhere. Whereas in Indonesia, the logistics will be like a key differentiator. So that's something that is a challenge we haven't built for when you're thinking about supply chain integration. Um, why we chose Surabaya and Semarang, honestly, is because of our partners. So Veolia is setting up a 20,000 ton bottle to bottle PT facility and is looking for building their vendor supply chain. So Semarang, Surabaya, Bali, all of these places are within the purview. Uh, Sem and Surabaya, of course, is a recycling hub, right? Like you have so many waste management op people over there. Uh, who we work with, we work with students actually. So we're working with the university and who are working with, and we're working with surveyors over there. And we have a one of our team kind of managing. Uh, in Semarang, it's actually an eight month integration process where we're, actually it's a very interesting project in Semarang because what we're doing is we're working with an L2 aggregator who has 50 L1 vendors under him. And we're getting him to comply, putting in machinery for him so that he can make more money and things like this, but then improve the, the, the 50 vendors under them and then, the, and then all the waste pickers and item buyers who serve these 50 vendors. And then connecting households to them. Uh, so we're about month two in an eight month pilot. Um, but yeah, we're looking to work with as many people as we can. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Hi. Um, I can imagine like there are lots of ways that's not collected, right? Single-use plastics and yeah. whatever. Um, anyway, I want to ask, like, what are your nightmares? Nightmares? Oh, it's uh, you know this thing of doing no harm. That's a big nightmare for me. Uh, so can you explain, like, where do you see? It? So one what of the can go wrong so that? Yeah. There so one can of the biggest issues we had, and and so we 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 got a lot of push from a brand to connect. Uh, households directly to a kabadiwala shop um, and we said okay but if we do that do we do we just disconnect all the waste pickers from 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 this kabadiwala shop uh, and then and so then we went back to the data and we actually found 70% or se closer to 80% of the shops were all single employee shops so which means that their vendor network were were itinerant buyers and waste pickers so we chose the appropriate folks that we felt and we, we, we aligned them on saying, look, we're going to connect you to more people, but we want you to get your vendors to work with you. And we knew that they would because they didn't have other stuff. So that was kind of like one way of like, okay, how do we not kind of like cut some levels out, uh, which is very, very important. Um, 
but yeah my biggest nightmare really is how do you do no harm like even with the informal sector data we we collected this data uh, and we we got a $200,000 grant from the World Bank and they said okay it's part of the global partnership for sustainable development data and we want to put this data out as open source what happens if you put it out as open source i don't know does that does that make it more visible for the government to come and say hey you know when if they if they get some big contract and somebody pays somebody and say okay let's close all these guys for competition what happens so we we need to think of the right level of aggregation of this data but we still need it's a still an important story to tell because it is so fundamentally different from how waste is managed in the west you know what i mean and it's a beautiful beautiful story about a model that is built on the backs of extremely entrepreneurial folks um and i think it's important to share that story so that's anyway so those are the kind of challenges one thing from our perspective of of there are a lot of things again recycling is a big question mark right like there's a lot of discussion about what the impact of recycling is and things like that but it especially here when you consider the economics of this decentralized supply chain there just isn't enough policy research on it you know what i mean it could be so much more efficient than what happens in london for example you know in recycling and <coughs> the truth is there is technology there are all sorts of really interesting technologies that people are building in the west the issue is the collection on this side they need volumes so for example single use plastic can be recycled it can be burnt in in a in a cement kiln facility with zero toxins certification and stuff like that acc has a contract from geocycle which which does that right so technically the product the, the we've actually created a new supply chain in chennai where they were with with plastic they're only doing the rigid plastics right so you're doing your what your shampoos your pet and things like that pet goes into fiber uh, all your hdp and pp make pellets and you can you know you can work with that the truth is we're at a point now where brands are really willing to invest in 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 plastic so we believe if you if you build the right simple tools you could get a kabadi wala to actually maybe manage uh, wet waste as well uh, you know maybe the bigger shops in that ward can have a small uh, composting pit or something like this so we're not talking about consumption side again our mechanism our vehicle is this for profit vehicle right and from that perspective there's a lot of waste that can be brought into that supply chain 180000 tons could easily quadruple there's a lot there's still a lot of capacity that the informal sector has i uh, just wonder if you've seen the movie called good guy bad guy no, it's I a waste picker story of bangalore okay i'll check it out yeah, yeah. one yes last the last test Yeah. Yeah, so if I can answer in a different way, so like the biggest issue in the developing world for waste management is the collection side. So there are a lot of technologies, some good, some worse than others, waste to energy pyrolysis. Honestly, I don't know if they you know they can ever be commercialized in in India just because of the nature of the supply chain. But uh My only point to that is you know I get very hesitant when somebody's like oh look at Singapore or look at London or look at New York or look at all these places because our, our cities operate in fundamentally different ways um I don't have an answer specifically should we build a trash island or not Yeah no okay so that's a very simple that's a very simple thing like see right now like government so world bank study says that municipalities in the developing world have to allocate 20 to 50% of their budget for waste management now this informal supply chain can take a lot of burden off that so that the municipality actually has more money to spend on different kinds of things so i think yeah i mean the informal sector is inherently a privatized supply chain it's just informal uh but there are ways to actually formalize without actually 
formalizing if that if that makes it there's, there's a way to build equity and traceability without formalizing and I, this is a more technical point but I'll talk about it later we have to close okay last question yeah uh, actually this uh, recycling of waste and actually <laughs> getting some profitability you know I, I remember it started with electronic waste yeah I think e-waste is going to be even a bigger problem uh, so uh, but uh, what are your views on that have you kind of explored that is it yeah no so so honestly like look I, I can get very technical about the mechanisms in which like recycling happens see recycling firstly is not um it's an it's not a it's it's not something that is like market mature you always need to manage the risk. So somebody has to pay for it. So the easiest way to think about it is viability gap funding. So I set up a recycling plant, but somebody in case the prices, something happens, somebody is going to guarantee my profit for that month. Either the municipality or now brands are coming in to do that, right? And the e big issue in e-waste here is a lot of brands put money into formal organizations, okay? They lot of money there's a there's actually a there's a brand PR, it's called a producer responsibility organization that brands mandated legislated in India the problem is the informal sector takes all of that material and they actually beat out the formal sector from a competition perspective so the reason is nobody understands the supply chain and you can't build and you can't enable an ecosystem if you're trying to compete with it just because you don't understand it so again the e-waste if it can be e-waste it can be any kind of waste if you build the right enablers this supply chain will work for you. And I think that's the biggest issue. Why e-waste is such a big problem in India even now is because the formal and the informal sector are fighting together. Thank you, Siddharth. That was amazing. Um, we have to close. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna have Tejas come up and um, say goodbye to everybody. All right, so um, may I have a round of applause for all of you for being such great audience members, please. <laughs> right, and um, respecting Sunday evening and all nightmare thoughts that you might be having about your Monday mornings, uh, I'd like to quickly go through um, a list of thank yous without which this uh, event really could not have come together. Um, firstly, at an institutional level, thank you, uh, Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, firstly for providing us with such an incredible, incredible, inc um, host space so that we could get together. Um, thank you, Center for Internet and Society. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> thank you to uh, Center for Internet and Society for just being pillars of support for our community in a way that nobody else can uh, in the city. And thank you to uh, OpenStreetMap India for getting us a rat -like band of people together so that we can be um, excited together. Now, in specific, I'd like to thank um, Professor Rahul Day and uh, Professor Hema Swaminathan from um, IIM Bangalore for, for um, agreeing to sort of work with us and collaborate and, and make this event happen. Uh, in particular, uh, Venkatesh Balakrishnan, Shashi Kalaji, and Deepti Sharma for teaching us that no is a word that really does not exist uh, in the vocabulary of IIM Bangalore because they have a yes for everything. So please, a big round of applause for them. In the same breath, um, I'd like to thank um, Chandru and Kavita, who are both part of CPP, for being such pillars of support. I don't know if they are in here or not, but a round, uh, but a round of applause for them as well. Uh, student volunteers at IIM Bangalore, um, CIS, thank you, Ajoy, Kutub, uh, Sunil, and Sumandro, for being such um, such pillars of support. Sorry, that word I know is going to get run at at some point in time, but it's true. Communities don't stand without uh, strong strong support systems. Um, our sponsors, Facebook, Mapbox, Mapillary, um, Grab, um, Map My India, and OpenCage Data. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> our speakers, our wonderful, wonderful set of speakers, um, especially everyone who couldn't make it here and are still here. Thank you for being, uh, thank you for being with us. <laughs> One quick note that, um, we can be we can be together, and we can sort of learn from each other. Um, and scholarships play a huge role in making sure that money is not the reason why you can't make it and be a part of the conversation together. So thank you for um, so thank you for individual donors in particular who've made scholarships happen, and um, our scholarship participants who could be here. Um, 
Okay, I know the clapping is going to get really tiring, um, so I'll try and wrap it up quickly. Uh, the program committee, thank you, thank you um, so much. Nama, Irvin, and Manning in particular um, for, for being our guiding lights. I, I can see two of you here somewhere. Um, thank you, thank you to, um, thank you to the people um, well, standing in the wings here, there, and back there, who've been such incredible, strong, hardworking team of uh, volunteers who've pulled together this, uh, who pulled together this event in such a beautiful manner. So thank you. And one last round of applause for everyone, um, and then we can sort of wrap it up. So um, before I, I officially uh, declare this event uh, coming to an end, quick, um, quick two or three quick notices. Um, videos, slides, and presentations will be made available to you as quickly as possible. Please check your, please check your inboxes and the website for updates. Um, individual emails uh, will not be shared with you, so please get in touch on Telegram account, and um, you can sort of connect with people there. Hopefully that account will not die at the end of this event and sort of will live on and, and continue to foster conversations. So yay. Um, participants, participation certificates, uh, those who do require, please email us at stateofthemapasia.gmail.com um, with, the, with the subject line participation certificate and we will make sure that they are sent out to you as quickly as possible. And with that, I call this event to an end. Um, Anthill Hacks, many of you have asked about that. Um, Dinesh will quickly, in 30 seconds or less, tell us what's happening there. There is a URL that's written on the pillar outside. Please open your browsers and enter that URL and you will find out more details. And 30 seconds start now. So, uh, people who don't know, if you don't know about Anthill Hacks, it's about one hour from here on a beautiful hill. We're just gonna meet and continue being together and finding out what we can do with Map Hacks. After the event, please join us at behind that tea place so we can do the logistics about how to go, wh what to do, and all that. So, is that 30 seconds? I think I have one more second, but I'll let. <laughs> Wait, we're not quite done yet. So, just one second. Um, so, Nama, um, so do you want to make an announcement? Or are you, are you just. All right, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, let's congratulate the West of Indian community for organizing this huge, uh, fantastic conference. Uh, one quick announcement. I know you are ab about to leave. So next year's uh, WSM uh, State of the Map Asia conference. And you might be wondering, where is, where is it going to happen? So we had a, a discussion this, this, this afternoon during the lunch. So what we have done is... So there are a few countries who have expressed their interest to host this conference next year. Um, but there are other countries who said they have to talk to their uh, community mem members back home. And there are other, still other countries who could not participate in this conference, but in one way or another, they have expressed their interest. So keeping all this in mind, what we have decided is, so we have extended the time until the middle of December. So the countries will express their interest, and, uh, and we'll see how many applications uh, come, and then we'll take uh, from there. So anyway, see you next year somewhere in Asia. <laughs> Thank you, Nama. Yes. And disperse. Okay, last, last thing. Uh, so if you are willing to hang out and want to catch up, just like how we did yesterday, um, where's Ari? Where we going? Oh, Big Brewski, JP Nagar. I yeah, I think we've made like a small number of reservations, so just so that they don't freak out when all of us show up. <laughs> um, so if anybody's interested, please come hang out. Uh, but drinks will be on you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming.